Okay, here's a quick video primer on amplifying genetic logic gates with a focus on the transcriptor and how you go from transcriptors to logic. Transcriptor is an element within an engineered piece of DNA that controls the flow of RNA polymerase along the DNA. So you can kind of think of it as an electrical wire, except instead of having electrons and current being regulated along a wire, we actually have a molecule DNA. We're controlling an enzyme called the RNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that carries out the reading of DNA or transcription we're controlling whether or not the RNA polymerase can flow along the DNA. So the T in the middle of a transcriptor is an asymmetric transcription terminator. It blocks the flow of RNA polymerase in one of two directions. So if we come in with a control signal and we flip the terminator, it's now backwards, the RNA polymerase can flow from left to right along the DNA. Flip the terminator back with another control signal, we block the flux or the current of transcription. So that's the transcriptor in a nutshell. How do you use transcriptors to make logic? Well, for example, if you had two different transcriptors recognized uh, or controlled by two different signals, you could do something like this. It'd be a Boolean AND gate. For example, in this configuration, either or both of these asymmetric terminators, these Ts, are going to block the flow or the current of transcription. All right, so no RNA polymerase flows from left to right. If control signal number one comes in and control signal number two comes in, both the terminators are inactivated and the RNA polymerase flux or current can flow all the way through from left to right. You have a high output. So signal one and signal two must be true in order to realize the logic and get the high output. This is very similar to how transistors are used to realize in, for example, transistor-transistor logic, a Boolean AND gate, which is shown below. What about a different Boolean logic function, not OR? In this gate, the output is high unless either or both signals are present. So for example, in the basic state, the RNA polymerase can flow all the way through. If either control signal one or control signal two are activated, one or both of the terminators will flip and zero out transcription, so you get no output. Here's a different type of gate, exclusive OR, uh, or an XOR gate. This type of gate, the output is high only if the inputs are different. And this is where the transcriptors actually architecturally speaking, better than a transistor, we're going to be able to implement an XOR gate without having to stack gates in, in a series of layers. So for example, in this configuration, the terminator, there's only one terminator here, it's in a, in a configuration that blocks transcription. So if no control signals are present, the output's low. If the first control signal activates, the terminator flips and the polymerase uh, can pass through. But now if the second control signal comes in, the whole darn thing flips again, and that, again, blocks transcription. So you get exclusive OR. The reason this is different from electronics, you see, for example, how you might make an XOR gate with TTL logic, um, uh, transistor transistor logic. You got a layer of four NAND gates. Um, the reason this is different is because the, the transcriptor can allow for multiple control signals to be integrated at a single spot on the DNA wire. It'd be as if you had a multi-input transistor uh, with clean uh, independent switching through different control signals at one spot. Uh, by doing that, you get a, a, a much more powerful or condensed architecture. At an abstract level, how do these uh, uh, transcriptor elements get used? Uh, we've got uh, what's known as a three terminal device architecture. So, um, you know, everything we've just been looking at, that would go into the box shown here called transcriptor elements. We have an input signal coming from the left. This is the flux of RNA polymerase coming along the DNA. We have an output signal on the right. That's the flux of RNA polymerase or the transcription current leaving the device. You might be wondering, where's the polymerase coming from? And, and the key point is, we don't care. Anything that provides a source of RNA polymerase could be a constitutive promoter, it could be a signal transduction pathway that responds to an environmental cue, who knows? And, and similarly for the output, where does the RNA polymerase go to? any gene you might care about. We want to be agnostic in terms of what drives the input and what receives the output, what the destination of the transcriptional current is and what its source is. Now, significantly, and, and here again, we return to the idea of a, of, a, of a transistor, there's a third signal, a third transcription source, the control signal, which determines whether or not the enzymes are made and, and the transcriptor elements flip and realize the logic gate. And, and what's going to be very important is modest changes in the control signal are going to be sufficient to trigger large changes in the output signal levels. And that's what's going to allow us later on to get to amplification of the signals. If the signal carrier stuff is totally alien to you, 
uh, please go check out a comic book called Adventures in Synthetic Biology. You can find it as a free download on the web and, and read chapter three called Common Signal Carriers. This is going to introduce you to the idea of transcriptional current, which we call polymerase per second or POPs. Uh, the transcriptor logic gates uh, that we're making have a POPs control signal, they have a POPs input signal, they have a POPs output signal. Okay, now the enzymes that are doing the flipping are called integrases. The logic that we're implementing is Boolean logic. So we call these things, when we put all together, Boolean integrase logic gates made from transcriptors uh, or Beal gates. And uh, you can see the different configurations for the, the six gates shown here. Um, this is how we predict they would behave. Control signal one on the bottom, control signal two on the left of each of these simulations where we're modeling the expected behavior of the device. And when we put them together and test them in a population of cells, we see that the expected pattern uh, with red representing a high output signal and blue representing a, a zero or low output signal matches pretty directly uh, what we would have predicted. If we unpack the population and look at distributions of single cells, we can see that um, each gate is producing a, a, a discretized uh, population where you have low cells uh, for the appropriate states and high activity or high cells for the uh, appropriate states. The levels are not exactly the same though, right? And that's going to be uh, future work where, where if you're an engineer thinking about what needs to happen next, we need to solve the level matching problem. But nevertheless, even with this first generation, we're able to, if you look at that vertical line, um, discretize the low outputs across all the gates and all the populations of cells from the high outputs. And that means we have a digital threshold that we can use to segregate low from high signals. Here's a different way of looking at this. And, and this is probably one of the, the, the most difficult uh, plots for us to have developed and, and one of the neatest or most important and distinctive things of this particular work. Uh, this is going to show the digital switching of the gates and, and signal amplification very directly. This is for uh, the exclusive OR gate with um, one of the two inputs coming in. What's shown here on, on the y-axis is the signal level. We're going to show two types of signals. In blue, this is the distribution of activities or uh, among single cells for the controller, the thing that's causing the gate to switch. And we're going to watch as we increase the control signal how does the gate's output change? And that's going to be shown in the red contours. The dark contour here is the contour representing 50% of a population of single cells. So as we're starting out, you can see that the control signal is very, very modest in, in fluorescent units, which are arbitrary units here. It's maybe averaging around 20, whereas the gate output is a little bit higher than that. It looks like it's around an average of 40. All right, so control signal in blue, gate output in red, and the key thing here is going to be to look to see what happens as the control signal changes. How does the gate output change? And is the change in the gate output greater than the wiggle or change in the control signal needed to trip or switch the gate? So for example, we're going to increase uh, the control signal very slightly. You can't, you can't really tell, but it's going up a little bit. The gate's not changing. We're going to increase the control signal a little bit more. You can again barely see it because it's a logarithmic y-axis. The gate output isn't doing very much. We increase the control signal just a little bit more. It's five-fold more on average here. And all of a sudden, you see that red contour set go way up high, orders of magnitude higher. We've just switched the gate. Right? So in other words, across these very modest changes in the control signal, we're getting a discrete digital amplifier, and the output signal goes way, way up. If we keep running up the control signal, the output signal cleans up a little bit more, it stays about that, it goes up a little bit, and you can extend this all the way out. The key thing here is over a very no narrow range or change in the control signal, we get a discrete amplification of the output, and this is what's going to allow us to realize both digital switching and signal amplification. If you uh, take a, a, a zoom out at the data, you're going to have to check out the supplement. There's a ton of data in the supplement of this paper. Um, what we're showing here is uh, a, a, a simple abstracted representation of amplification of the control signals on an apples to apples comparison, if you will. We're comparing how the control signal is changing on the same physical basis as how the gate output is changing. And we're showing here for each of the gates across a common control signal range, we're getting amplification. And so that's pretty exciting for us because it allows us to imagine uh, doing signal restoration layering gates if we needed to and so on and so forth. One last thing about this project, uh, which we feel is pretty important, these Bill Gates and all the uses thereof that, that we've been able to imagine. We have uh, permanent gates, rewritable gates, and so on. 
we've decided to contribute these to the public domain using the BioBrick public agreement. And so if you want to see uh, that we actually did that, if you want to find other parts that might be free to use when you go to program and DNA, if you want to eventually give some parts back, that'd be really great. Um, check it out. Go to this website and, and see what might be cool. So thanks uh, for watching. If you found this interesting, great. Otherwise, sorry, we'll try to do better next time.